a better multi mood and also a you know a better practitioner afterwards so i'll leave it at that uh, iliana john paul please uh, feel free to uh, to kick it off hello everyone long time no seen i hope everybody's doing great um, everybody returned well at home and everybody is now getting ready for the last stretch before the um, court in Vienna. Uh, you know me, my name is Ileana Smirano. I'm a senior associate with Jones Day. I practice arbitration in Paris, focusing on both investor state arbitration and commercial arbitration. And I started just as you did by participating to the Vismut, although, oh, long time ago, um, I was not part of the honorable teams that made it in the finals. I was like mod modestly somewhere in the middle, but this mood court changed my life and arbitration in generally, uh, because in general, because I decided to make it a profession. I started in, uh, after, after my studies, I, I started my career in arbitration by doing a PhD, I wrote a book, which I published. I spent some time in academia. I taught arbitration, I coached mood court teams, but then I realized while teaching that my life belongs to the practice and my personality fits better working with clients, developing cases and being really in the trenches. So um, I switched from academia to private practice and here I am in front of you sharing a few thoughts on how to um, on how to have a successful mood court experience and how to lay the foundations for a career in the field. Over to you, John Paul. Yes, let me echo Eliana's comments. Uh, it's good to connect with you again. Uh, I think I can speak for all of our Jones State team on the ground in Nairobi this past year. It was once again a pleasure to be with you and really an honor for us to participate in this process with you. I think we all share a, a, an understanding of how transformative the Vismut can be uh, for our personal lives. And so I'm I'm thankful to be part of your, your experience there too. So as for my background, I am a litigator within our financial markets practice, which means my practice largely focused on complex financial products and the litigation and regulatory issues surrounding them. Uh, that includes arbitrations, uh, state litigations, federal litigations in the United States and across the United States, including uh, large financial institutions primarily um, and around sophisticated commercial lending products as a general and investment product. So that's my background. I too was a Moody. Um, I uh, had a wonderful experience doing it um, and it taught me the value of how, how this can form an, uh, an important informative role in the lives of young practitioners. So I, I hope that it, we can help you today share a few thoughts really about how to make the most of this experience um, and use it as a model for your practice to come, right? Um, and how the skills you'll develop here will also be useful as you move into practicing law um, and either directly or in sort of a parallel sort of area, both of which I think this will be a valuable experience for. So. With that, uh, I want to sort of introduce our general framework of how we'll be approaching this. First and foremost, I want you to understand this is designed to be an informal and a conversational setting. We highly encourage questions, comments that you have, and participation. I think you'll get more out of it if you do participate. I know that may seem uh, difficult, right, in a large group video conference setting, but uh, be brave. Feel free to jump in. We also want you to understand this is intended to be a safe space, a place where you can share comments or experience and we can reflect on them as a group. We're not here to criticize uh, or to uh, suggest uh, th that what you've done is something less than acceptable. To the contrary, this is supposed to be a safe space. And with that said, we're going to kind of structure this in roughly three or four parts. Um, and we'll pose it as questions that we'll attempt to answer together as a group. So with that, let me kick us off to uh, the next slide. And I'll ask our colleague Tim to pass us along. For so we've jumping. called this, we've right. called this presentation uh, kind of tongue in cheek, building the plane slash drone while flying it. Um, and the reason we we named it thusly is because one of the key skills that you must develop as a powerful advocate is your ability to think on your feet. Sometimes they say there's a saying, and it may not be something you've heard before, but at least in 
uh, in the US kind of context, building the plane while flying it basically reflects that skill of adapting and, and doing things on the fly, meaning in real time, responding to sort of current developments as best you can. So we're gonna talk about that because you're going to do that in the context of a competition in Vienna and frankly in life where you'll be faced with new information, a development you may not have expected um, or maybe you did expect and, and using that information, internalizing it and then responding um, in real time or in a longer, slightly longer than real time. The skill sets are highly aligned. We're gonna cover them in a series of about four questions. So with that, let's go over to our first, our first question slide. All right, first I have to say shout out, uh, shout out to these photos. I am a grateful and appreciative that you guys are better with photos than I am uh, because it's, it's really wonderful to have a memory and photos do a wonderful job. So thank you for taking the photos. Um, do that in Vienna, do that in your experience. You will treasure these later. I, I will uh, confess I have a, a picture here in my office uh, which is from my experience in the VIS mood with some people that I now count as very dear friends. So take pictures. All right. But the question is, what do you do with feedback or advice that you receive? So let me kick it over to you, to Ileana. Let's talk about where, where are all the different areas you're going to get this, this information from? Right. So um, last week, all of us, we experienced a little bit of what's going to happen in Vienna, but more than that because we all met, we all started discussing, engaging, we gave you lectures, we told us how we see um, the problem, how we see um, the way to proceed with a mood court, what attitude to adopt, what to do, what not to do. So that was one way of approaching the feedback that you received by way of presentation. And afterwards, as we progressed with the experience, you engaged in short presentations, one against the other during our training sessions, later on in a pre moot and you started receiving feedback from your peers. You received feedback from your trainers um, during the pre moot from the, from the arbitrators or from coaches of other teams. And the question is, what do you do with all of this feedback that you receive? What do you do with like this host of information that you're getting from everybody? Is this overwhelming? Are you able to cope with it? Do you agree with it? Do you not agree with you? Are you actually able to distinguish between something that would be useful for you or something that would not be useful for you? Is it too late to change something in the way you structured your argument? And we understand that in, it was a very dense week where you were kind of surrounded by all of these sources of advice and everybody was pushing on information and you. And the question is, what do you do with it? Do you receive it? Do you incorporate it? Do you reject it? This is what's going to happen in Vienna as well. You're going to see that the pre mood was or the mood in Vienna is not going to be less different than what we did, except that people will be better prepared. They would have known their materials much better. But the arbitrators fall in the same categories of the people you've seen so far. You will have arbitrators coming from the academia, the professors who also will also serve as coaches. These are the people that will know the problem in and out, that will know um, how to ask you questions, when to ask you questions, and what questions to ask you. You'll also have practitioners like John Paul and I coming from law firms, people that will have the time to read the problem, will have a certain knowledge of the problem, so they will, would know generally what to ask you and when to ask you, but not as good as, for example, a member of a team or a coach. You're gonna have also people who are just coming there, they're arbitrators, they're experienced, but they do not have the time to read the problem. And so the question is, how do you take their advice? All of them are required by the rules to judge your performance, to grade you and to give you feedback. And sometimes you will notice that some of the people that give you feedback are completely off the track. Some people are to the point. They will 
pinpoint, they will flag the, um, your weaknesses and your strength. They will know what to tell you that would be useful. You'll have other people who will be completely off track because they did not have the time to prepare. And so the question is, what do you do? We wanted to share our experiences with you in this situation because the goal is that you're keeping your mind clear on what's your goal, on what do you want to achieve, and you're not letting yourself influenced by the bad advice, but you're taking the good advice and you're incorporating it. And we wanted to give you a few tips on that. But I'm going to give it over to John Paul to share an experience that marked his uh, his uh, Muti experience in in Vienna. In yes. this respect, thank you, Eliana. The, so the first point before I share my story, and I think it will help you, um, is consider the source, right? And what we mean by that is think about the the biases or the bases for the feedback that this individual is offering you. My experience in the Moody, I had a very interesting um, experience as a Moody in the VIS on one of our, I think it was a round of 32, as a matter of fact, uh, arguments. We had a panel that was comprised of very different individuals. One of the panelists was a very senior litigator and arbitration practitioner from the United States from a very distinguished firm. His attitude during the course of the argument was pretty aggressive. In fact, it became so aggressive that you almost couldn't get a word out. It came down to a point where you couldn't respond to his question with half of a sentence before he interrupted you, told you to stop, and then asked a different question. It was very, very aggressive, and intentionally so, as we learned after the fact, right? Because his feedback was, in fact, that you should be more aggressive, like perhaps his own presentation style was, right? That was not feedback that was shared by the other panelists, but it was his personal view. The reason this matters and why I'm saying now consider the source is because this is a good example of someone who may bring their own expectations or their own biases and offer that as a basis to advise you or give you feedback that may not always be uh, from a shared or a consensus viewpoint. So for example, it's not unknown that in, in the moot you will meet, and in life, right? You will meet people from different backgrounds, some of whom have a particular view about ways to do things. This practitioner, in fact, felt you needed to adopt a more aggressive presentation style, but that's based on his experience in the United States primarily. And it's not unknown that in the United States and perhaps even in the UK or other common law jurisdictions, a more aggressive sort of questioning and presentation style is preferred. It is viewed as stronger or better presenting. But that may not be true for the broader audience that you will face. So you have to, when they're giving you feedback, you should think about the source. Are they an individual that would have the experience to provide sort of broad-based advice? Do they come from a jurisdiction or from a background that may um, unintentionally overemphasize some particular characteristic or quality, as was the case with my experience with the arbitrator from the United States? Um, also, uh, consider, too, what you'll do, and we'll come back to this in tips and tricks, right? But consider, too, what, what understanding you may develop in advance of your presentation about people and the sort of uh, biases or the bases that they will bring to the argument that you will present. So we'll come back to that. But the first thing is to, to number one, consider the source. What are the biases or the bases that those individuals giving you feedback may have for the feedback that they're giving you? All right, that's gonna lead me right into point number two, which is consult with your support group. Support group is kind of a loose term, okay? I know uh, it's, it's, it can mean many things, but in the context of the this, that most likely means your team and certainly your coach, possibly others that you have a trusting relationship with who will help you interpret the feedback. All right, so coming back to my experience, what did I do with the feedback that said, 
you need to be more aggressive, right? I took that feedback and I shared it with my team who was in the room to observe the argument and with my coaches who were also in the team to observe the argument. They helped me realize two things. Number one, they felt that the presentation was already at the line of aggressiveness because it was trying hard to push back against an arbitrator. Number two, they helped me understand that, that may not be contextually appropriate, especially when you have a mixed panel with civil law practitioners and common law practitioners who have different expectations about the tones that may be appropriate or within a reasonable realm of what's appropriate for a presentation in real life and in the vis. Ileana, my experience is that, you know, US practitioners tend to be more aggressive anyway. What's your, what's your thought there? It's true. And in fact, common law, people coming from common law jurisdictions are more aggressive. Like, whereas civil law lawyers would tend to listen more, um, interrupt less, and appreciate a, to a less, less aggressive tone, very deferential to the tribunal and to the other side. Not aggressive, certainly. And you will see, as I encountered in my experience as the MOOC, there would be some arbitrators. And once again, this is really from the civil law countries, which would never interrupt. Am I off track that this person is not interesting? Am I boring? Am I not engaging? But you shouldn't take it to heart because some of them will be like that. And they are instructed. You should also know that arbitrators have their own instructions given and they are encouraged to ask questions, but some of them will just not do it. And this should not be off-putting for you you should continue with your pleading and move on, just as if that's expected of you to do. But again, it's true, aggressive, less aggressive style. That, that I, I've noticed it also in, in real life, in practice. I think you see this, and to Ileana's point, it certainly is reflective of what I've seen in real practice. And uh, you you need to understand the style of the panel you're presenting to. It's extremely valuable in any context. The this included, but real life too. Um, so we covered the first two points. Right. And and just one quick thing because I want everybody's probably asking uh, themselves like, but how would we know? We're gonna come back to the subject when we're gonna share a few tricks and trick uh, tips because there is one way to know um, how how to deal with every type of situation. And we'll, we're gonna teach you how. Yes, great. So the first tip, excuse me, the first point was consider the source. Number two was consult with your support group. Now number three, and that is a little bit difficult, but in my experience, there's something in every piece of advice that you receive, even if it's mostly not that helpful. And that's okay, you may discover and you should take the liberty to understand that not every piece of advice that you receive will be wonderfully useful to you. You should take the piece of it that is useful to you and helpful, take that, work with it. We'll talk about that in a second. But do understand that in every piece of advice, even poorly delivered or off base, there's usually some small piece that's useful um, and that's worth considering, even if it isn't directly the advice that the person gave you. And I invite you to both discard the part that's not useful to you, but consider what is the piece that is useful to you. I'm going to come back to my experience with this aggressive arbitrator from the United States. At the end of the day, he was saying you needed to be more aggressive. That wasn't great advice at the end of the day. What was good advice, and the piece that I did take away from it was, you need a better strategy to deal with people who are very aggressive in order to make the point that you need to argue as an oralist, right? So again, the answer wasn't be more aggressive, but there was something to his observation that you need to find a way to deal with an aggressive arbitrator that doesn't want to let you get two words out before the interrupt, okay? 
that's just a case point of, of understanding. There's usually some piece of advice. You don't need to take all of it, but usually there's some valid observation that's worth keeping and thinking about. And that's gonna bring us to our second big topic. Uh, so we'll move on to the next slide. And that is really, how do you internalize the feedback and use it to your advantage? Ileana, I'm gonna pass it over to you for some thoughts around strategies for internalizing and making good use of feedback you receive. Internalizing one's feedback is making the best out of it. This does not mean beating yourself down for not doing something or for not being someone that you are not. I would wish to be Taiman and like come in a room and be like two meters tall and dominate the room, but that's not gonna happen because this is not who I am. So um, I will have to find one other way to fill in a room with my presence, given that I am half the size of Taiman. Internalizing meaning listening, and then discerning, is this something which helps me improve? Is this something that is fit for me as a personality? Is it something that will help me improve? Or is it something that is just going to make me, like put me down and make me perform worse? And when you're getting to that point, when somebody or some or a remark puts you down, you're discarding that. That is not for you. The goal is to build something and to improve, to get better and better. But within all of this process, you have to remember to remain yourself. There is no need to change your accent. If you normally gesticulate within reason, use gestures. They're your tone. If you speak in a soft voice, there is nothing to do with it. You just have to find other way to make your presence more persuasive. Don't change yourself. Work with who you are because everybody has their strong point. Now, when I was a Muti, there were I participated in two tombs. One was the Jessup, and I was a 3L, just of, of a sum of you. And at the time, I had much more time to prepare. And I thought that I was doing an amazing job. Me, without any moody experience, I was very self-confident. I memorized my pleading. I was like, I'm going to rock this. And my colleagues, my teammates, everybody was like, we were so pleased with our performance that one day our coach comes. And that's like in the early 2000s. So we did not have the iPhones She's bringing the cameraman with like a huge camera. And she's like, girls, we were a team of girls. We're just going to record you. And you're going to see how you perform. And we're like, fantastic. Like, let the show begin. And they're recording. And we all think we're amazing. And I think that I have like this very strong voice. And I'm eloquent. And then we play the thing. And when we play it, we're like, oh, it was horrible. It was horrific. Um, I cannot tell you how we were like our discord was discourse was disjointed and how we were like uh, uh, all the time and how we would like struggle to find words and how we did not make eye contact and how we were like following our notes and it was a disaster. And I don't know if you guys have this, but I always like have the impression that my voice is different than the one that you actually hear. And I think it's for everybody that's this. Um, and it, it was so bad that we were just like all like staring at it. And, and then, you know, there were like two possibly, we were all like super down. But at the same time, we were like, well, if we need to improve, let's do it. Let's, let's do something about it. So this is when I personally, together with my teammates, started to rehearse in front of the mirror. And this is something that I'm doing up to the present moment when I have something very important to present. And it's not necessarily a, a presentation at a conference, but when I need to plead before a real tribunal, I rehearse certain parts in front of the mirror. What do I do? by doing that? And I encourage all of you to do it and we'll discuss whether whether anybody did it and, and what's, the, what's, the, what's the catch with it. First of all, you're controlling yourself. Like you're looking at yourself, you control your gestures, you control your demeanor and your tone. 
And second of all, most importantly, it helps you to project yourself because at some point you're going to stop looking at yourself in the mirror, but you're going to project yourself in the reality of a competition, of a real trial. And that helps you to already put yourself out there and it, it gets you in, it prepares you for, for, this, for this experience. Now, when you're internalizing, we, we, we talked about this feedback. So that's one, one of my experience. Like you have to distinguish between two things. How do you perceive yourselves? When you are, while you are pleading, how, how do others perceive you? Because that's not the same thing. Um, as I, I'm, I'm taking you back to my experience, I thought I'm doing a great job. In reality, when I watched myself, I was not. Um, when you're doing this, it's very good right now. You are, this is the final stretch. You guys all have found. Record yourself or plead in front of your peers, your parents. My parents, when I was participating at this, at, not at this, at Jessup, didn't speak a word of English and they don't to this day. But I was lining them up and I was reciting my pleading in front of them. And I was asking them, like, what do you think about my body language? What do you think about my voice? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? So that is part of internalizing, projecting and making yourself better. John Paul, what's your experience with that? I, I agree with the recording um, and I, I ironically, I, I really don't like watching recordings of myself. So hopefully I'll never see this recording again either. But uh, to be fair, I, I would be curious to know, you know, with the ease of technology now, standing up a phone on a, on a platform in front of you, how many of the teams have tried to use recordings of yourself as a method or, or rehearsing in front of a mirror? So this is the audience participation component because I <laughs> appreciate hearing from you guys if that's something your team has done, either verbally or with a, a reaction within Zoom, either are fine, but I'd like to kind of get a sense if that's a strategy that you have used to date. And please right. don't be shy to take the floor. You guys know us, we know you. I see Winfred has said yes, they're using that. Annie Maria has also been doing that good. That's wonderful, very effective. All right, very good. So I got a couple responses, but if, if I take by negative inference that you didn't raise your hand or signal that you did, it means you have a great opportunity to do it now. You are not so close to the competition today that it wouldn't be useful for your process now. It is at the end of the month, um, and that's going to feel like an eternity in some ways. Um, and there's definitely room to use the recording to improve your performance. And it's something you can repeat. As we've talked about this process, recording it once is great. Do it again. Give yourself a chance to improve, then record it again. See if the gesture you're making that you don't like is happening. Look for the awkward pause and test yourself again. Because again, coming back to what Ileana said, the video recording in the mirror do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And that is they offer an objective view of what's happening, what you're presenting into the room. The, the experience you have in your own head while you're talking is almost always different than the experience that's being received as you are presenting. So it's important because the videotaping will give you a better view of what, what is being received in the room as you receive it while watching the video. So if you haven't done that, I urge you, please consider using the videotaping and use it as a pathway to improve your performance. You will find things you didn't wish you found, I promise. It happens to everybody um, and that's normal and it's wonderful to get that objective view. The other point that I'd like to make here and it, it sort of ties into what we're talking about with the videotaping is you need to try new and frankly, uncomfortable things. You will receive advice along the way that may not feel very comfortable, but one of the best ways you can discern if the advice is for you or not for you is to actually try the advice. 
So if the advice is you speak with your hands too much, it's very distracting. Please stop moving your hands. And, and they may suggest, how about you sit with your hands folded on the table and never move them, right? That may be uncomfortable and hard, uh, but try it at least once, maybe more than once, because the reality is when you evaluate something sort of uh, theoretically, it is necessarily different than when you evaluate something practically. The practical evaluation comes in trying it. Do it. Do it in front of somebody whose opinion you respect. See how it goes, because the experience you're having inside in your mind and in your heart is almost always different than the experience that's happening outside. And sometimes you will find things that inwardly feel terrible. They feel very uncomfortable, but outwardly they look great, right? Let me offer just one other quick story, Ileana, which Ileana knows, some of you know that before my time in law, I had a career singing opera around the world. And one of the most embarrassing experiences I ever had was with a very famous opera singer doing a master class in front of some of my very, very skilled peers. The experience uh, was, the advice was absolutely crazy. Singing a very difficult aria, the, the instructor for the master class wanted me to do something physically difficult. So she held my, my feet by my ankles, okay? So she grabbed this foot with one hand, this foot with the other hand, and then she made me walk on the ground with my hands. So I had to put one hand on the ground, the other hand, and she would wheel me like a wheelbarrow, if you're all familiar with that, right? It has two sticks and a wheel, right? She would push me around the room, right? With me walking on my hands as I'm singing a very difficult aria. And if you know a lot about singing, what's that? Oh, sorry. So I, I uh, sang the aria walking around the room like a wheelbarrow with this very famous opera singer holding my legs, right? It was very, very embarrassing. I've never done anything quite so embarrassing as that, to sing in front of my very talented peers while walking around on a wheelbarrow. But it did something wonderful for me. I never have since performed an aria walking around like a wheelbarrow in a real performance, but the experience itself helped me realize what was happening and what that teacher wanted me to understand was that I was stuck in my head. The aria was less powerful and the phraseology of it was not very effective because I was stuck in my head about how difficult the aria was, how physically demanding and all of the many different pieces that are required to perform at a very high skill level. And walking around like a wheelbarrow forced me to get out of my head. I could no longer think about all of these things, sing the aria and walk with the wheelbarrow at the same time. So trying uncomfortable things can really add value because they can change the way that you internally are interacting with the situation. And that's really valuable when you're trying to put on the best presentation you can for the audience so that they can receive your best. So I encourage you, please try uncomfortable things at least once, whether it's arguing the opposite side of a problem or speaking with uh, a quieter voice or changing it, give it a shot. There's usually something to it. And even if it's uncomfortable, you can learn something from that experience. Or even speaking without notes, we had this experience during the pre when our brilliant colleague from Pretoria, Kaylee, she was using notes and I realized she knows her stuff. She does not need to have this page and look at it. And I told her, get rid of your notes. You really don't need them. You, you know your problem. Like trust yourself, trust your knowledge and your ability to fall back on your feet and improvise. And she tried that. And I was so pleased when she came after the final to tell me, you know, I took your advice and I didn't read my, my notes. And I was so pleased because it worked so well when you guys saw her perform, she was brilliant. And, but I knew where she was coming from. She was stuck in her head that if she didn't have her like safety element, the page with her notes, she would not perform and yet she did. So these are the kind of things that you can do to prepare yourself. I am not advising everybody, anybody to try at home what John Paul's um, opera singer did with him because that's rather extreme, but little things like this, you can definitely try. Yes. 
So let's move on then to the next slide with tips and tricks um, for preparing for showtime, really. And showtime, you'll forgive me for using that, but you know, as an opera singer, that's showtime is the time you go on the stage. Showtime is the time you walk into the room to present your argument, to represent your client. That's showtime, because that's when people are beginning to form their opinions of you uh, and the quality of your presentation. So what are some tips and tricks for, per, for uh, preparing for showtime? Let me just say, the first trick is not really a trick at all. And that is to prepare in advance as much as possible. There is no substitute for practice and preparation. Really, the truth of the matter is, is that the quality of your presentation will always be tied to the level of your preparation. So prepare as much as possible in advance. Don't, don't delay things. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Take it seriously. Plan it out and prepare with as much diligence as you can reasonably apply. The next point is equally important, and that is pick a cutoff. It will be very individual, but you've got to know yourself. There's a point at which preparation sort of puts you back, right? It can leave you in the wrong place, stuck in your head, thinking you need something you don't. You've got to pick a cutoff point, after which you're going to focus on something else. And that cutoff point, I promise you, is before you walk in the room for your presentation. You cannot be preparing for your performance on the stage. That's not the time to prepare. The time to prepare in some reasonable point in advance. Now, this is very individual and you need to know yourself. But in my experience, I tried to stop preparing when we left to go to the argument. I did not read my notes furiously on the way to the, to the location. I wasn't studying in them outside the, the hallway where we walk in the room. And I certainly wasn't doing that as we were in the room itself beginning for the argument. That, the time for preparation has passed at that point. You need instead to get your body and your mind in the right state. And oftentimes for me, to be honest, it was doing something unrelated. I actually found it was more useful to talk about an interesting subject that wasn't related, to meet a new, new person and learn about their background, than it was more useful to do that than it was to review my outline one more time or practice my roadmap that one more time. It, it was counterproductive. So for you'll need to figure this out because it's very individual, but pick a cutoff point and then cut it off. Stop the preparation. Get your spirit and your mind in the right place at that point so that you can be your best self in the presentation. And while you're doing this, when you step in those rooms, while you're getting ready to plead, before you do that, please congratulate yourself. Be proud of where you got through your work. You guys are doing something amazing, something that you're gonna remember all your life, irrespective of where will you be, where you will be in terms of ranking. You should tell yourself before pleading, I am so proud of myself. I got here. I have learned so much. I am here before this distinguished people. Some of them are the most renowned arbitration practitioners in the world. And here I am. So do be kind on yourself and do not let fear overpower everything and block you because all of you in this mood board are winners. You all came from here and all of you by the end of the mood, you'll get here. So everybody wants so much from it. Another trick, we're moving to something very important. When you will get to Vienna, you're gonna enter in this university. The schedule is published on the windows and the door of the last floor of the university, which is called Dachgeschloss. You're gonna see like, Dozens of pieces of paper with names of the universities, and you're going to see the rounds, but you'll also see the names of your arbitrators. If you can, take a moment, log in immediately, and research your panel. We're going back to what we discussed a few minutes ago. Know your arbitrators. Know who they are a little bit. Huh. This guy is coming from a law firm. He's going to ask me more practical questions. Whereas 
Mr. X is a professor. I should expect to be questions about question about separability or the concept of sovereignty or this or that, CISG. Um, think about that, take a moment. It is important, it prepares you mentally also because all of us are afraid of uncertainty of the new of what will be. So by doing that, you're overcoming this fear and you already are doing something towards improving your performance before some strangers really. I wanted to take a moment and I brought to all of you a book uh, that we recommended when we first came to Nairobi at the Primo. It is called The Devil's Advocate. I'm not sure whether you guys see it very well. It is written by Jan Morley. He is a, well, a Queen's Council at the time. And he gives amazing tips on how to prepare to try for trial, how to prepare witnesses, how to prepare yourself. And I'm going to read something for you on persuasiveness, being a persuasive oralist. And he says, we are all dressed well. We head, our head is held up. We do not hide. We have control of our hands. We move purposefully. Our voice is a bit deeper and slower. We have eye contact. We stand like a rock at the optimum angle. We are ourselves. We do not try to be someone else. We are not. We project our personality into the case. We seek, if possible, to be liked. At the very least, we jealously guard respect. We are polite with everyone, always. We are deferential to the judge, always. We check our judgment against the views of others. We keep what we want to say simple. We keep it brief. We give it life. And what we say should be irresistible. I recommend each of every one of you, not now before the mood, but for your life, Try to find this book, The Devil's Advocate. You'll find it. It's a polemic on how to be seriously good in court. And it's a wonderful book to read. Um, every time we have mood courts or every time I plead, I just take it and I just browse through it. It's, it's a wonderful little um, tool that can help you get better. And I just stuck in the chat the name of the book and the author. Uh, so if you, uh, if you are looking for uh, the book, that's the one she's referencing. All right, Jan Morley, yes. This, um, you know, this really, I think, brings us home to sort of one of the last sort of points that we'll make. Um, and it's, it's remembering that you want to focus on having fun. I know this is a difficult and a trying experience, but it's supposed to be a fun one, too. Um, this experience will be your own. The reason you congratulate yourself is because you have now achieved something. You've taken something away that nobody can ever take from you, right? This is yours to treasure and cherish and live with forever. And there's no amount of feedback or scoring or anything that can ever take that away from you. So own it, take control of it, enjoy it, have fun. It will, it will change your experience from being one you'll cherish forever to one you will dread forever if you allow the situation to control your thoughts and the way you experience. Don't do that. You have the power to decide what your experience will be irrespective of the situation or the outcomes. So let go of those outcomes and just own and enjoy the process. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the last point that we wanna make. And we'll go to our last and final slide here because we're coming up on time. Um, and that is one of the key things that we need to remember to do is is to celebrate the successes of others. This is a community, you are part of a family. We've said that now many times, but in order to be a great family member, you need to learn to celebrate the successes of others. That includes not only people from Africa and the Moot and your team, which I hope you are naturally ready and, and delighted to celebrate their successes, but it means also for your competitors, right? Celebrating the fact that they presented a wonderful argument 
celebrating the successes of the people around you will change your experience and will make you a better advocate in life. It is, uh, there is such a shortening and, a, and a, such a dim diminutive experience when you're unwilling to celebrate the successes of others because it changes the universe in which you're winning to such a small little cabin thing that may not even be relevant. The reality is, is that as a group here and as a broader community in the VIS, we should celebrate the successes of others um, and be willing to, uh, to find joy, right, in, in the experience, no matter what the outcome is itself. I hope you will take this last piece of advice, especially to heart. It is not at all limited to the VIS mood. This is a secret that I think will change your experience in your profession as well. If you can learn to celebrate the successes of others, I think you will enjoy a much richer practice in law and in life. Um, and so we offer this to you with heartfelt earnestness because this is what will change your experience from I'm a winner and I'm a loser to I'm almost always a winner because I have the ability to accept and celebrate the victories of others who I um, care about and want to see succeed. So that's really the sort of nut of our presentation here. I hope it has been useful to you. We're short on time, but if anybody has questions uh, or comments, we're happy to engage with them with you. Um, and we thank you again for your time and attention to being here. One more comment. Part of celebrating the success, successes of others is giving back. In a month's time, you would all have participated in the Vienna Mood, but this is not the end of the world and not the end of the road, in fact. Please give back. Please involve yourself in training others and sharing your experience with your peers, with your younger colleagues. And please be a part of this wonderful community um, that thanks to the VSmooth and thanks to Professor Eric Bergsten was created and is lingering now for, the, for, for 30 years. Well said, very well said. All right, this is your chance. Any questions or comments? We'd be happy to hear them. And if that's not the case, that's okay. We wish you all the success in the world. We wish you joy, the joy of sharing, the joy of being in Vienna, the joy of being excellent because all of you are winners. Well, thank you very much. Taman, with that, I think uh, we'll thank you for the time and we'll pass it back to you to uh, conclude the presentation. Thank you so much, John Paul and Ileana. Um, I think that was very helpful and very important advice, um, especially I think the last part of, you know, whatever you do in Vienna, try to see yourself as a winner, even through sharing the joy that others may have. Um, it's very important in Vienna. It will be difficult to do, I know from experience as well, and we all know that. Um, but it's also something that indeed is very important in your daily practice, in your future careers, right? It's numerically speaking, you will not always be the single winner of every competition like setting you will find yourself in. Um, and if you if you master the, the art that John Paul and Ileana have, you know, kindly uh, enlightened you with, I think you have a, a more successful life, a more happy life for yourself, but you also make it a better place for the others around you. Because if you like to enjoy you winning, which sometimes in your life you will, and you should celebrate that, you like to see others around you that celebrate that with you, right? So I think that's that's super important advice. And thank you so much for sharing that, both from a you know a past fist mood, muti I've learned by now. Uh, perspective, but also from your uh, your 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 life practices today. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank uh, you all. All the best. Thanks. All right. Thank all the best. Much. We'll be closing for. We'll be closing now, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, uh, which we'll announce in a few days or a few weeks. Um, and uh, we all hope you can find some time to attend the last few lectures in in you know as part of your preparation to Vienna. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care.